This month we have some first Pinephone Pro impressions to share, as well as some Pine Time and Pine Dio news. Let's just jump into it. But first, thanks to everyone who contributed to the update, including JF, Alex, Brian, Lucas, and if you want more videos about open source stuff, check out my channel, Pizza Loving Nerd. This is the video version of the community update, so if you want more details, check out the blog post version, but this video will give you a synopsis. Let's start with housekeeping. We set up some automated spam detection systems to combat a lot of spam that has been plaguing Pine64 chats recently. The past 8 weeks have seen a huge uptick in spam in the channels, so hopefully these systems fix it up for us for a while. Next up, Fostum is going virtual again this year, which prompted us to consider scheduling a dedicated Pine64 in-person meetup in 2022. We're considering hosting the event in the May-July timeframe, likely somewhere in the heart of Germany. So, if there's enough interest for this event, we will try to set something up like this. We would also like to have a virtual component for those who are unable to travel during the pandemic still, so make sure to let us know if this is something you would like to arrange in the comment section. Now to PinePhone Pro news. We have closed the PinePhone Pro dev pre-orders two weeks ago since the number of applications has far exceeded the amount of available dev units. We are also going to issue the developer coupons this week. Dispatching coupons was delayed because of a mainboard issue that is now fixed, but this should not affect the shipping timeframe for dev units nor the availability of Explorer Edition units. Lucas has received an early PinePhone unit and has not been able to put the device down. He writes that the UI animations are smooth, applications open very quickly, and scrolling in the web browser or interacting with elements of an app feel instant. The device does run warm, but not uncomfortably hot. The SoC reaches a temperature of 68 degrees after running a load on all cores for 10 minutes, then it drops down to 58 degrees after a minute of cooling down. Another 10 minutes of running Firefox and doing nothing got to 47 degrees, and 55 degrees is the average temperature when doing general web browsing. This is all in Celsius, just so you know. In conclusion, it does technically get hotter than the original PinePhone, However, thanks to the thermal design, it feels cooler than the original PinePhone to other people using it. A couple other observations that you cannot tell from just renders and photos of the PinePhone is that the display's colors are rich and the screen itself is bright, the vibration motor is a lot more powerful than the original PinePhones, and 5GHz Wi-Fi connectivity has been very good. Thermal pad on the back case is much larger and distributes the heat well. The battery is slightly different and labeled with a new phone model and the SIM card slot and SD card slot are slightly different as are the buttons on the edge of the phone. As for software, the kernel is still being worked on right now, but everything should work except for the sound, phone calls, cameras, USB, and camera flash. Some of these are being worked on already and will be resolved quickly, while other things may take more work for it to be working. More information about the PinePhone Pro software will be following in the coming months as developers get their hands on the device. Next up, the PinePhone keyboard has been scheduled for release in December and will cost $50. There was another delay because of fixes we applied to the keyboard membrane as well as some extra polish including no sharp ends and no mold lines, but that's not all. Another difference are the keys. The font is thick and legible and keycaps pop even in low light. The keys themselves are matte black and with the flossy case, it makes a very nice combination. The travel and wobbiness of the enter key has also been improved since the prototypes and there are some other structural changes to the top where the pine phone will be inserted. Under the hood there is a fix preventing overcharging of the battery as well as other electrical improvements suggested by developers. Lastly, the open source firmware works out of the box on Manjaro Plasma as well as Arch with Fosh and there are no firmware related issues. Originally, the keys needed some break in time, however, once typed on for a few minutes, the membranes would settle on the keys. This is part of why we are pushing the release of the keyboard back to improve the initial experience you get when you start using it. One thing you may have missed if you haven't read the follow-up to the community update last month is the full launch of the SO Quartz with two host boards. Well, today we are announcing a third host board called the Blade. The Blade is a host board designed to fit into a 1U server rack and in a sense brings the legacy of the SO Pine and SO Edge cluster board to the next generation of Pine64 modules. 
More than a dozen host boards can be housed in a server racket, making any cluster compute project highly scalable depending on the requirements. This host board features a gigabit ethernet connection, a micro SD card slot, a USB 2.0 header, digital video output, 40X GPIO header, UART output, power barrel jack, and a M2 PCIe slot for storage. All I.O. is located on one edge of the blade, allowing for tight stacking inside the rack. These host boards should provide early adopters for their desired use case. However, the blade is not the last quartz board we're working on, so stay tuned. AffiniTime 1.7.0 has been released a few days ago, and this version brings manual time and date setting without the need of a companion device, as well as a new motion and step service that allows companion apps to fetch your step count. This has already been integrated into ITD, as well as AffiniLink and Amazfish. The motion service also exposes raw XYZ values from the accelerometer, which may be useful for something like a game, and there's already a demo of a 3D cube using it. Lastly, JF has welcomed Riku to the AffiniTime team. Riku has already made contributions to many AffiniTime features, and he has accepted the invitation to join AffiniTime. Finally, we would like to highlight Nico's blog, which has several articles about Sailfish OS as well as the Pine Time and Affini Time. Make sure to go check it out. Developers are still working hard to enable software support on PineDio devices. Lup Yan is writing an article about the gateway, which introduces it, explains how it was tested, and also explains how to connect it to the Things Network, Public LoRaWAN Network. And RTP has also provided us with a new image for the PineDio gateway. This image comes pre-installed with the ChirpStack LoRaWAN stack, supports TTN, and automatically resizes the file system to the SD card. Finally, there are some new prototypes for the PineDio stack dev board, and they will be sent to JF very soon for testing, so stay tuned. That's all for the video, and we hope that you have a great rest of your month.